praise team. I love that song. I think next to Happy Birthday, Keith Pugh, that's my favorite song. Speak, O oh Lord. Thank you. Thank you. Am I on? Testing. Okay. When we were having trouble earlier, Teresa reminded me that 14 years ago, uh, a dear friend of mine passed away, and he was our sound man at our church in Jackson, Alabama. And uh, I knew I was in for an interesting ministry when I found out our sound man, his name was Buzz. Seriously, his name was Buzz Williams. He had some other real name, but they, everybody called him Buzz. But he was a sound man at First Baptist Jackson, but he passed away 14 years ago today. So I think Buzz was just trying to get us to remember him today. So uh, in honor of Buzz, we had uh, Buzz a few minutes ago. But this morning we're in Matthew chapter 6. We're continuing to study the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, the sermon actually begins in Matthew 5 and goes through the end of chapter 7. So far, Jesus has been talking to us and telling us about the keys of the, to the kingdom, what people look like who live in the kingdom of God. In the last portion of chapter 5, we dealt with six statements from the law, six, six statements that the Pharisees and scribes had taken and they had twisted them or interpreted them so that they could make themselves feel better. The scribes and Pharisees, like many of us, were all about themselves, all about themselves. But you know, Jesus takes them back to the law, back to the Word of God, and, and, uh, and in some references are to the Ten Commandments. You know, thou shalt not murder, thou shalt not commit adultery. And then he interprets and he takes it to a different level. But you know, the power of the Ten Commandments, the power of God's Word, the power of the law touches our hearts automatically. I mean, we read those Ten Commandments and we have a problem, don't we? And that's kind of the purpose on the Sermon on the Mount is to show us that this is not an external religion. It's a matter of the heart. It's what's going on on the inside. Ray Comfort uh, and, uh, tells a story in his, his little book. He said that there was an editor in a south or west Texas town, a little small town, and he had some extra space in his newspaper. So he just printed the Ten Commandments without any comment he just stuck the Ten Commandments in his newspaper and put it in the next day's edition. He said that seven men left town and one man wrote and canceled his subscription because he says, you are getting too personal. <laughs> See, God's word, the law convicts us that we all have a problem, that we all have a problem. And now Jesus moves from the teaching of the law to uh, religious practices, how we conduct our religion how we carry out the things that he's going to be talking about, uh, giving, praying, and fasting, okay? Three things when done properly are acts of worship. But again, the Pharisees had taken these three wonderful things, giving, fasting, and praying, and they had turned them into an opportunity to demonstrate their self-righteousness. So they had abused uh, some very important things for all of us. But let's look, Matthew chapter 6, verse 1. Beware of practicing your righteousness before men to be noticed by them. Otherwise, you have no reward with your Father who is in heaven. So when you give to the poor, do not sound a trumpet before you as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, so that they may be honored by men. Truly, I say to you, they have their reward in full. But when you give to the poor, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that your giving will be in secret and your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word this morning. God, we desire this morning to, to experience true worship. Father, to worship you in spirit and in truth. God, we pray this morning as we examine our hearts. Lord, help us to see that our, whole, our sole desire, our sole desire is to be pleasing to you in all that we do. God, forgive us of our hypocrisy. Forgive us, Lord, when we are not honest with others or even honest with ourselves in many ways, and particularly when it comes to worship. God, we pray this morning that you would speak to our hearts, Lord, as only you can. Lord, be Lord in this place this morning, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Giving. You know, 
That's an interesting topic, isn't it? You know, it's, it's interesting to see giving expressed in different cultures. In the early 90s, we went to Russia. Teresa went with me in 95, and I went in 92 and 93. And it was interesting, when you would walk the streets, we went to St. Petersburg. And almost invariably, as you would walk the streets, and you would see a beggar from time to time sitting on the side of the street. And I was always impressed and somewhat amazed that even the most common of Russians would come by and they would toss something into the hat or they would give, put something in their hand. And after seeing this on several occasions, I, I commented to our guide, I said, wow, I am so impressed. The Russian people are so generous. I mean, they give to people on the street in America. Most of the time, we just kind of walk right past those people. And the guy kind of smiled and said, well, what they're giving, they give a, a ruble. A, really, it's almost worthless. It's just a little copper coin that it really has very little value, but they give to everybody, to, to most beggars, not all the time, but they do give to most beggars, and they give the minimum amount possible. But also, Russians believe that if you give to a beggar, you'll have good luck. That was kind of a good luck charm. You give to a beggar, and you will have good luck. I thought, well, that's kind of interesting. That's interesting. And I thought, you know, how many times do we try to do something like that. We try to, you know, we're going to give so that we will, God will bless us and have favor on our life by God. But we wouldn't give to the poor to have good luck. Giving to the poor has always been a, a trademark or a hallmark, if you will, of Christianity. The Greeks and the, Jew, the, Greeks and the Romans knew nothing about being generous. I mean, when Christians came on the scene, they began to give to the poor. They began to help the needy. And uh, the Greeks, particularly the Romans, were amazed by this. Uh, this was written in 125 A.D. It's still kind of faded. 125 A.D. by Aristides, Aristides, a philosopher, who was writing as a defense to Emperor Had Hadrian. Okay, So Aristides, the philosopher, was writing in defense of Christianity to the Roman emperor. And this is what he says about Christians. They do not commit adultery nor fornication. They do not bear false witness. They do not deny a deposit nor covet what is not theirs. They honor father and mother. They do good to those who are their neighbors. They love one another. And from widows, they do not turn away their countenance. And they rescue the orphan from him who does him violence. And he who has gives to him who has not without grudging. It's amazing, the Christians, when one of their poor passes away from the world and any of them sees him, then he provides for his burial according to his ability. And if they hear that any of their number is imprisoned or oppressed for the name of their Messiah, all of them provide for his needs. And if it is possible that he may be delivered, they deliver him. If there is among them a man that is poor or needy and they have not an abundance of necessaries, they fast two or three days that they may supply the needy with their necessary food. Wow! Can't you see how this group of people, this cult, as the Romans, they were a cult, this cult got the attention of that society because they took care of people. They were concerned about people. So the Jews and the Greeks were amazed at this, that these Christians would give to the needy. They would go without themselves for two or three days so that they could provide for a brother who was in need. That's amazing. So it was kind of shocking to the Jews, and to, I mean to the Greeks and to the Romans, but the Jews knew better. Listen to me, the Jews knew better. They knew they should be looking out for the poor. From the very beginning, God had instructed his people to take care of poor people. It, it did, God gave the Jews specific commands about how to harvest their fields. When they harvested the wheat or the grain, they were not to harvest the, the edges of the fields. They weren't to go all the way to the end or the corners. They were to leave the grain around the edges of the field so that the poor could come. And they could harvest the grain. They would have something to eat. They would have something to take home. That's what Ruth was doing in the field of Boaz. She was harvesting behind Boaz workers, and so she was harvesting grain so that she could take it home to Naomi. They'd have something to eat. Every third year, the Jews were instructed to bring their tithes of grain into the city and to share with the poor people. In the Old Testament, Proverbs chapter 19, verse 17, the Jews were taught, he who is kind to the poor lends to the Lord. 
and he, the Lord, will reward him for what he has done. Proverbs 19, 17. God was very serious about taking care of the poor. God was very serious about this matter, as, the, as Jesus addressed here, giving alms. As a matter of fact, in Ezekiel chapter 16, we all know what happened to the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah. We know they were destroyed. And we know there was great immorality in, in the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah. But in the city of Sodom particularly, the, the city of Sodom, this is what God said to Ezekiel about Sodom's destruction. He said, Behold, this was the guilt of your sister Sodom. She and her daughters had arrogance, abundant food and careless ease, but she did not help the poor and needy. Thus they were haughty and committed abominations before me. Therefore I removed them when I saw it. The Jews were well aware of their responsibility to take care of the poor. So they were doing it. But the problem was with the Jews that they had taken what God had intended to be a blessing for the poor and they had made it a show for their religious self-righteousness. When you give alms, Jesus said, do not sound the trumpet. Can you imagine? Do, do, do. It's time to get, we're going to draw as much attention as possible to my graciousness. You should all be humbled. You should all be impressed. I'm about to give my alms, and I want everybody to see me. I mean, I'm not exaggerating. That was the attitude of the Jews. Do not sound the trumpet before you as the hypocrites do. And they do it in the most public of places. So we see their attitude. It was one for pomp and show and, and drawing attention to themselves. So they had taken what God instructed to be a blessing to the poor and they had turned it into a demonstration, a show of their own self-righteousness. Three things this morning. First of all, Jesus condemns the practice of hypocrisy. Beware of practicing your righteousness before men to be noticed by them. Otherwise, you have no reward with your Father who is in heaven. So when you give to the poor, do not sound a trumpet before you as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets so that they may be honored by men. Truly, I say to you, they have their reward in full. What is their reward? Their reward is simply the pat on the back, the applause of men, the praise of men. Jesus condemns the practice of hypocrisy. Now, hypocrisy, we, we hear that word all the time. It's an interesting word. Hypocrisy, actually, it, it came from the theater. In those days, they didn't have elaborate costumes. And so as many times, you know, actors would play several different roles. And so anytime they wanted to change role in the theater, they would just take a mask and they would put it on. They would wear one role with a mask and be one person. They would take the mask off and be another person. They would grab another mask and become a third person. So actors in the theater who wore masks were called hypocrites. <laughs> That's fine in the theater, but Jesus condemns it in the church, and he condemns it in the world of religion. Test it. There, there we go. Thank you. If I had to shout like that the whole time, I'd be in trouble. Thank you, KJ. I better turn this off so that we won't have... He's sending mixed signals. Okay. So Jesus saw their hearts. They were, they were pretending to be honoring God and being a blessing to the poor, but what they were doing is they were trying to pat themselves on the back, to be hypocrites, but be, to pretend to be something they were not. Now, Jesus condemned hypocrisy in several places. Mark chapter 7, verse 6. Rightly did Isaiah prophesy of you hypocrites. As it is written, this people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far away from me. Do you see that? This people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far away from me. See, there are two types of hypocrites, I think, in the church. There are those who pretend to be Christians when they're not. And then there are those who pretend to be spiritual when they're not. And in both places we are living, the, both groups are looking for the applause of men, the acceptance of men. And Jesus condemns that. Matthew 23, 27. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. 
For you are like whitewashed tombs which on the outside appear beautiful, but inside they are full of dead man's bones and all uncleanness. Luke chapter 12, verse 1, Beware of the leaven of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. Hypocrisy. So we see hypocrisy has been a problem for a long time. People pretending to be something that they are not. Pretending to be Christians when in reality they're not. Pretending to be spiritual when in reality they are not. And we do that for the praise of men rather than for the pleasure of God. And that's what hypocrisy is. Jesus condemns hypocrisy. See, hypocrisy, A, hypocrisy desires the approval of men. Twice in, this, in these four verses, Jesus says, uh, he identifies the desire that they had. He says they give to be noticed by them. They give their alms publicly as a public demonstration to be noticed by them. Hypocrisy desires the approval of men. Again in verse 2, they give so that they may be honored by men. They give to please men rather than to please God. Let me ask you, have you ever done something at the church? Have you ever done something for someone else hoping that other people find out about it? Well, I have. Well, as I was preparing this, to keep that is your heart. I mean, you are such a hypocrite in so many ways. I mean, so many times, you know, as a pastor, when you're setting up tables, boy, I hope somebody walks in. <laughs> when you're cleaning the halls, man, if they only knew what I do around here. When I'm cutting the grass, I think, boy, I hope somebody rides by and sees the preacher. He's a good guy. You know what happens when I do that? Of course, you see how my sinful heart, I'm just being honest, but all my reward goes right there. I mean, there's nothing in it. That doesn't please God at all. It goes right down the tubes. And I know, I don't you look at me like I'm the only one in the room who thinks like that. I guess I am. But that's just my heart. I have a, hip, a spirit of a hypocrite many times, and I confess that to you, because I want people to see what I'm doing for God. It's not just giving our money. It's helping our neighbors, taking that meal. It's making sure everybody knows, hey, we've done this. We've done that. Jesus condemns that spirit. See, hypocrisy desires the approval of men. But I'll tell you something that's even more dangerous than that. Hypocrisy deceives the hearts of men. Hypocrisy deceives the hearts of men. We're, you know, we're hypocrites when we pretend to be something we're not in an effort to gain the approval of others. Jesus warns us about that. But hypocrisy is even more dangerous because we can deceive ourselves. Jesus says, when you give to the poor, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. I had a friend of mine, he used to make this comment to me often. He said, don't break your arm patting yourself on the back. <laughs> don't break your arm patting yourself on the back. See, sometimes we deceive ourselves. Jesus said, don't let your left hand know what your right hand's doing because we shouldn't be commending ourselves. Boy, you're a good guy. Man, you are really got it together. As Ernest T. Bass says, you can afford to be mighty proud of yourself. No, we can't. Nothing that we do, all of our works are like filthy rags in the eyes of God, but when we do it for his glory, God honors that. God rewards that. God is pleased. It brings, it brings pleasure to our Heavenly Father when we do things in the right spirit, and it brings dishonor upon Him and pride to ourselves when we do it in the wrong spirit. It's deceptive. We can deceive. You know, we feel good about how generous we are. We can deceive ourselves into thinking that we're a great Christian and doing great things for God when in reality, when in reality, we're just trying to, get people to notice us, to make a name for ourselves. You know, and again, you can take this so many directions in big ministry and, and big, uh, big events or do it, whatever. We want people to notice us. We can deceive ourselves. It's possible to gain all of our reward from the praise of others, and it's also to gain all of our reward simply by making, praising ourselves. We can do that. See, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. That's what Jeremiah 17 says. And so we think like that, don't we? We think like that. We, just, we try to deceive other people. We try to pretend to be something we're not, and we deceive even ourselves. Hypocrisy denies the approval of God. 
Jesus said, you, when, you, when you are a hypocrite, you have no reward with your Father who is in heaven. You have no reward with your Father who is in heaven. See, our desire should be, as believers, should be to please God. I think Paul said it best in 2 Corinthians 5. He says, our ambition, whether at home or absent, is to be pleasing to God. And I hope that's your ambition. I hope that's your desire. And so God is not pleased. We have no reward. Hypocrisy denies the approval of God. God is not impressed when our giving is done publicly so that we can be honored by men. And so much of charity today is done in that manner. You give so that you can have a building named after you. You give so that you can be recognized. And you give, and uh, I'll talk more about my philosophy in just a minute, but that is so prevalent in our society today. God is not impressed when our giving is done publicly. Seeking the glory of men instead of the glory of God does not please God. But listen to me, it is very dangerous. To seek the glory of men rather than the glory of God, listen to me, is a sign of unbelief. To live for the glory of men rather than the glory of God. Listen to the words of Jesus in John 5, 44. Jesus speaking to the, to the religious crowd. He said, how can you believe? How can you believe when you receive glory from one another and you do not seek the glory that is from the one and only God? That's how dangerous this attitude is. It's a stumbling block to faith. How can you believe? Jesus said. He asked the question. It's a dangerous situation to be in when we live for the glory of men rather than the full glory of God. How can we believe? How can we genuinely seek God and seek His glory? When we live for the glory and praise of men, we do not honor God. As a matter of fact, as I said, it's a great stumbling block. But you say, wait a minute, preacher. What about Matthew 5, 16? Where Jesus himself said, let your light shine before men in such a way that they may see your good works. And what? And glorify your Father who is in heaven. Yeah, let your light shine before men so they may see your good works, but glorify your Father who is in heaven. See, there's the difference. Our motivation. See, we can do the right thing the wrong way and still be wrong. <laughs> Bless our hearts. It's hard, isn't it? You know, we can do the right thing for the wrong reason. If we are doing things to draw attention to ourselves, that's the wrong motivation. But if we're doing things for the glory of God, that's the right motivation. We are not to hide. You know, Jesus was talking about our influence in the world when he said, let your light shine. We're not to hide in fear of persecution or fear of men. But in giving, we're not to give for the praise of men. A.B. Bruce says this, we are to show when tempted to hide and hide when tempted to show. <laughs> you, you understand it? We should, we're to show, we should stand up when we're tempted to hide. When the fire's, when the fire's heating up, and persecution is a, is, is a reality. We're to stand up. We're to show. We're to let our good works shine before men. Let our light shine before men as they see that we're standing for Christ. And so when we're tempted to hide, we need to show. But when we're tempted to show our good works in terms of our generosity and our giving, when we're tempted to show, that's when we need to hide. That's when we need to be secretive. Jesus condemns the hypocrisy in giving. Secondly, Jesus commends the practice of giving. But he says, but when you give to the poor, notice that, verse 3, but not if, but when, when you give to the poor, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. Now, here's, Jesus does not say, okay, new rules, time out, we're starting over. Don't worry about giving anymore. I know God said something about that was big in the Old Testament, New Testament, grace, grace, grace. No, Jesus does not say that. Nowhere will you find Jesus saying that giving is not important. As a matter of fact, just the opposite. Did you know that Jesus talked more about money than he did any other subject? He used it as an illustration of our, where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. And so giving is vitally important. He doesn't say that's legalistic. Don't worry about it. 
Giving is important. As a matter of fact, in uh, Matthew 6, 19, we'll look at a couple of weeks. He says, do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in or steal. How do we store up treasures in heaven? We store up in treasures in heaven by giving here on earth, giving to others. When we give to the Lord, we're storing up. And like Randy Alcorn says, you can't take it with you, but you can send it on up ahead. We're storing up treasures. And what's more important, as Jesus says, where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. So as we are sending it on, as we're giving, we're demonstrating a life of faith that pleases God, we are giving to the Lord, we are storing up treasures in heaven. Giving was important to Jesus. In Luke chapter 12, he says, Beware and be on your guard against every form of greed. Then he proceeded to tell the parable of the rich man, the rich, successful farmer, you remember? His land was very productive. So he said, what shall I do? I have no place to store my grain and my goods. This is what I'll do. I'll tear down my barns and I'll build larger barns. He was a sound, smart businessman. And there I'll store all my grain and my goods. But here's where he got in trouble. There I'll store all my grain and my goods. And then I'll say to my soul, you ever talk to your soul? Soul, you have many goods laid up for many years to come. Take your ease, eat, drink, and be merry. You remember how the story ends? But God said to him, You fool, this very night your soul is required of you. And now who will own what you have prepared? Foolish man, did not lay up treasures in heaven, put him in his barn for a rainy day. And then here's the point of the whole story. Jesus said, so is the man who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. So the question is, how can we be rich toward God? By giving. By giving. Giving to the Lord. Giving to the Lord. Jesus does not encourage his followers to neglect giving in any way. Giving is to be done as an act of worship to the Lord and not for the praise of men. How's it to be done? Four things. Giving, first of all, is to be sincere. When we give, we're to give as unto the Lord. We do not give to be seen by men. Now, let me just kind of be honest. If you're visiting with us today, you can just kind of take a nap for just a second. I don't pre preach on money very often. Those of you members at Open Door, been here six, five and a half years. I don't, we did a stewardship, a couple of sermons, uh, one year, a couple of years maybe. My philosophy of giving has always been this, that if a person's heart is right, then they're going to give. I just assume that. I've always, I kind of made a, a couple of assumptions that, you know, if your heart is right, you're going to give. Money's not going to be the issue. I've always assumed that healthy sheep will reproduce. That if we're growing in Christ, we're going to be talking about Christ. We're going to be bringing people to Christ. And, but giving particularly, we don't preach much about, about giving. If our hearts are right, giving will not be a problem. Now, let me just say this. Open door historically, and as is today, we are in a tight place financially. Tight place financially. Our deacons and elders at the, our meeting of the 1st of February... Uh, we committed to a 40-day fast among ourselves, not totally from food, fasting from food, but fasting from something. We're praying and seeking God's wisdom for the direction and the provision of our church and this ministry. Again, I, I feel like, you know, giving is important. And I really, as I look around our sanctuary and I see our members, I don't think that any of you are robbing God by not tithing. I really don't. I don't think that's the problem. I feel like the problem is that we, we haven't grown to the point, you know, where we can support the, the expenses of the ministry. You know, Jesus commands us to go and make disciples. The bank has mentioned that too. <laughs> go and make disciples. You know, it'd be great to have this place full. But we've got, you know, again, trying to lay the foundation. But giving, you know, giving is important to the Lord. It must be done in a way where we are giving to God. 
you know, we've been faithful at the church to give to missions. We increase our mission giving one percentage point every year. We're at 13% now that goes to, to missions, home mission and, and foreign missions. Um, and so giving is to be sincere to the Lord, to the Lord's work. And this is the Lord's work. This is the Lord's work. Paul said in 2 Corinthians, he says that, Paul, that giving is like sowing seeds. You know, you think about it. The more seed that you sow, the bigger the garden. The fewer seeds you sow, the smaller the garden. He who sows bountifully will reap bountifully. He who sows sparingly will reap sparingly. But the amazing thing Paul says there, now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will supply and multiply your seed for sowing. All that we have comes from God, and God is the one who supplies the seed to the sower. So I'm not worried because God is the one who supplies the seed. He is the one. Like E.V. Hill says, if God can get it through you, he'll get it to you. So our giving is to the Lord. It must be sincere. When we are sincere about our giving, we give to the Lord. This kind of giving is to be done cheerfully, not grudgingly. God loves a cheerful giver. We give to the Lord not to be seen by men. We do not give in order to get something back. Well, how many times do you hear that? Let's get a little seed money here, a little faith money here. Yes, so that God will... No, God's smarter than that. God knows our heart. We don't give so we can get something back. We give to honor our Father, to please our Father. We give out of love in response to needs. We give, we're to give sincerely. Now, I've said this, God demands the tithe. 10% is a starting point in your personal family budget. God demands the tithe. He deserves the offering. And if you'll do that, he'll defend the savings and direct the expenses. God needs to be Lord of every area of our lives. So giving is to be sincere. Secondly, giving is to be secret, secretive. Excuse me, secretive. We've already mentioned this, but just let me say that when we give to the Lord genuinely and sincerely, we don't want the praise of men. Do you hear me? When we give sincerely, we don't care about the praise of men. We don't, care. Our, we don't let our left hand know what our right hand is doing. See, it's better to give and to receive the blessing through giving. That's our earthly reward is to receive the blessing that God gives us. We're not to give for the applause of others or even for our own applause. And we don't give so that we can feel better about ourselves. John MacArthur says, What has been done should even be a secret to our left hand, not to mention other people. Whether the person we help is grateful or ungrateful should not matter as far as our purpose is concerned. Because our purpose is to glorify God, to please God, to honor the Lord. Quickly, giving is to be sensitive. Let me tell you, it's not natural to want to give. Just remember that. Anytime you're, you're prompted to give, take that from the Holy Spirit. Because it's not natural to want to give. Now, Jesus said it is more blessed to give than it is to receive. So if we are sensitive to the Holy Spirit and we're prompted to give, then we need to obey that. Sensitive. Teresa and I made an agreement when we were early in our marriage that as a married couple, if God ever led either one of us to give, the other would not question it. In other words, if Teresa said, Keith, we need to give to this situation, the Holy Spirit had prompted her, okay, let's give. Or if I came to her and I said, okay, here's something that's on my heart, let's give. Okay, we're in agreement because it's not natural to give. You understand that? So we want to be obedient to the Holy Spirit when he prompts us. So we should be sensitive in our giving. And I also mean that we need to be sensitive to the needs around us. Giving is a love response to the Lord and to other people. That's the proper motivation, to give out of love. It's a love response to the Lord and to other people. We give because God has given so much to us. And see, God is the great giver, and we want to be like our Father. That's what Jesus said at the end of Matthew 5. In order to be like your heavenly Father, he causes his Son to rise on the evil and the just and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. And we want to be like our heavenly Father who is a giver. So giving is to be sensitive, but, but don't misunderstand me. Don't wait till you feel like giving, okay? All right. You say, well, the Holy Spirit hadn't prompted me to tithe this week. Big deal. Be, give out of obedience. 
We're obedient there, okay? We give out of obedience. Don't wait till you feel like giving. Give out of obedience. D, giving is to be sacrificial. Our giving will call for sacrifice, and it should. King David said, said it best. I will not give something that does not cost me. And the guy wanted to donate his barn, wanted to donate his oxen. I'm not going to sacrifice something to the Lord that does not cost me anything. Giving is sacrificial. The widow's might. We hear that term all the time because this lady came in the temple, and she placed her offering, her alms, into the, the, the container. And Jesus said, that woman gave more than everybody else in here. And, you know, they're thinking, well, it sounded like so little. Jesus said, that woman gave more than anybody else in here because she gave all she had. Everybody else gave out of their abundance, but she gave all that she had. Giving is to be sacrificial. That's why giving is an act of worship. Giving is an act of worship. Number three, this is not on your handout, but it should be up there. There we go. Our Father rewards the practice of giving. Our Father rewards the practice of giving. In these four verses, Jesus refers to God as Father two times. In 18 verses, Jesus refers to God as Father ten times. I think there's something significant there. Jesus wants us to know that God is our Father. And we want to please our Father. We do not give in order to become a child of God, we give because we are a child of God. We give because we are a child of God. When we give cheerfully, when we give uh, uh, sacrificially, when we give secretive, all the things we talk, God is pleased. God is pleased. When we give publicly, drawing attention to ourselves, we receive our reward in full. Jesus says our Father will reward us. He will bless us as we give. You know, again, perhaps that will come in the form of material blessing as he supplies seed to the sower. It may not, but it really, it really does not matter. He will certainly bless us spiritually, and that's far greater blessing. Ultimately, our reward is in heaven. We're laying up treasures in heaven as we give. Jesus, again, is dealing with our heart. Are we going through the motions just to impress people? To ease our conscience, are we giving to the Lord? As I close, let's say this. Let's each of us just pray earnestly Consider the matter of, concerning the matter of giving. You know, in light of the scriptures and in light of our circumstances, God, what would you have me to do? How can I honor you with my finances, with my money? Let's honor the, our Father by trusting in Him as we give. This morning, it's important from Scripture that we honor our Father. Do you know God is your Father this morning? Do you know sincerely in your heart that you've been born again, that you've trusted in Christ, that you've turned from your sin and placed your faith and trust in the one who bore your sin on the cross? You can never be good enough to become a child of God. Christ died for your sin once for all, the just for the unjust. He takes our sin, we take his righteousness. And that's how we become a child of the living God. If you've never trusted Christ, then you are still outside of God's family looking in. But you can come into God's family today. But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, even to those who believe on his name. Let's pray. Father, thank you this morning that, Father, not only do you know the balance in our checkbook, but you know our heart. Lord, you know us better than we know ourselves. And Father, forgive us for the spirit of hypocrisy that is so prevalent and know in my life. Lord, I pray that you would cleanse my heart. Lord, I pray that you would help me to focus on my heavenly Father at all times. Lord, to disregard totally the praise of men, the concerns of men, the applause of men. And Lord, I pray that each of us here this morning would live with one chief desire, and that's to please our Father in heaven. Lord, through our giving, through our praying, through our fasting, through everything that we do as acts of worship, through our life. But Lord, particularly this morning in the area of finances, Lord, may we honor you with what you've entrusted to us. May we live in such a way that our giving demonstrates that we are living by faith. Lord, as you have blessed us so abundantly, 
God, may we be a blessing to you and to your kingdom and to other people. Father, we pray this morning for those within the sound of my voice who do not have all that they need, Lord, who are going without. Lord, help us who have to be a blessing to those who have not. Lord, if it means to fast, if it means to go without, Lord, may we be willing in your name to be a blessing to those around us. God, change our heart. Speak to our heart, Father, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand together as we close our service. As you respond this morning, has God spoken to an area of your heart? Has he put a finger on maybe something in your life that, you know, is just not right? The scripture says if we confess our sin, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. If you need to do business with God this morning, certainly we invite you to come to the altar. Our elders and staff are here. We'll be happy to pray with you if you need someone to pray with you.